Fragrance. When you woke up this morning, did you purposely say, I'm going to confine myself to a box? Or do you just avoid putting any conscious thought into today? When you're busy going at it, literally or figuratively, do you ever find yourself pausing for a moment to realize what's going on? Or are you just reacting? When you hear the saying, may I have your attention please, do you continue as you were? Or do you consider the information you're about to receive might actually be valuable? When I was growing up, my mother used to ask me to do things. And sometimes her reasoning was, because I said so. Looking back, I wish perhaps I took the time to pause, think, and consider the ramifications of my choices. Good Thursday to you. Today is Thursday, October 13th, 2016. And this is episode number 24 of Pause, Think, Consider. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Today's task is to go try some sort of food. Doesn't matter if it's a drink, solid, liquid what it is go try something new for more information on today's subject you can go to the website pause think consider dot com slash decision continuing on with special guests special week remotely in sacramento with gene and today's topic is going to be on decision making and the decision making process because as Gene and I have found aside from being very different personalities of people although they always say that opposites attract but we have very different decision making processes that we go through and we want to get into how we're unique our own individual decision-making processes and then if you're with somebody because that's the thing is while it would be great to be around people that are very much like yourself really the name of the game is being adaptable because if you can't work with anybody that's different from you it's going to be very challenging to be successful. It's going to be very challenging to put yourself in an environment and surround yourself with people that are exactly like you. Maybe that would be ideal. Maybe the ideal thing would be around people that are completely opposite of what you are. And so really breaking down how, knowing what your decision making process is identifying with what that is and then determining how you can be adaptable how you can knowing that your decision making process is different because gene and i are very different how you can work with other people that have a different decision making process than you so without further ado we're gonna get right into gene And she's going to talk about her decision-making process. And she's got some really great resources that help back up why her decision-making process is not only unique, but it's a positive process. Well, I don't know if you'd actually call this completely unique. I think a lot of people use this approach, but only recently in science has it actually been articulated what it is. So for big major life decisions I've always had a strong gut. Meaning that not I can't actually eat whatever I want but a strong gut and meaning that when a decision comes um, something that's big life changing course altering or whatever it usually always struck me like a bolt of lightning. I will be sitting there, something else will be going on, and all of a sudden it'll be, oh, 
I'm going to do this now, or so-and-so is going to do this now, or whatever is going to happen. But it just came to me as a sudden insight. I used to think this was because I was just a strong personality. I knew what I wanted, and once I knew what I wanted, then it was dumb to just try to do anything else because I was already set in what I wanted to do. But it turns out that the the gut check or the hunch is actually something scientific and something that you can train. And once I learned this, I kind of started to train mine. I did a little bit of research. I looked into Psychology Today. They have a great article called Gut Almighty. You can look at that. Jesse will link to that on his site. Another one is Live Science, the Science of Intuition. And basically what it talks about, both of these articles talk about, is that it takes a lot of effort to put every decision you make into rational thought. There's actually studies done of people who have maintained brain damage who cannot make intuitive decisions and it'll take them hours to decide between something as simple as cereal. When it comes down to it, every single decision you make every day involves some level of intuition. Your brain has decided between things for forever, since when you were little, and it's learned to pick up on all these little cues. If it has to do with people, it's facial expressions, ways they're standing, ways they say things, maybe certain phrases that your brain has just heard multiple and multiple and multiple times, and it can make a connection of, oh, this is going to happen next. Same thing with yourself and what you want to do. And once I learned this um, about seven years back, that's when the science of the gut check and intuition was coming into play. The military actually did some research on it because it's so influential in battle and crisis determinations. And they found out how accurate it could be that for some people in terms of judging people and personality is that that immediate flash of intuition before a lot of biases come into play can be more accurate. And so once I learned that and I knew that as a person who likes to make quicker decisions and I tend to go and gather little bits and pieces of information as I go. It's like that. I knew that that was my decision-making process. And so I tried to learn how to hone it and how to pay attention in ways that I could gather that information so that when I got flashes of insight, it was as well as informed as possible. So all my major life decisions from, from college to my high school, joining the military, they were all things that kind of built for a while. It was a major decision time, you know, over the course of a year, I was wondering, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And all this information would come in, and then suddenly I would be sitting there, and it was, bam, you're going to the Milwaukee High School of the Arts, or you're going to Swarthmore College. I can even articulate the exact moments that most of those decisions hit me for Swarthmore College. It was, uh, I went on a tour. And we were talking to people, and I was a little bit suspicious of Swarthmore. I had made it on the wait list there. I was already in at Davidson, and I liked Davidson, but it wasn't, it was like a 90%, you know. And I remember we went into the engineering building. We were talking to this guy from Ghana, and I asked the question that I asked a lot of other people. I said, why did you choose to come here? And he said, that's because people here want to change things. They want to change the world. And as soon as he said that, it hit me. I want to go here. I'm going here. And, of course, later on when I'm talking to people, I came up with all sorts of other reasons as to why. And other things that I saw on the tour or learned, and there was tons of other reasoning. But all of it kind of culminated at that moment. Uh, I had a, a similar relevation with uh, Jesse, and then I had a one when joining the military when I was getting out of college. I was trying to figure out what I could join, what I could do that would involve all the skills that I had, and I was thinking, well, I want to be athletic, and I want to use sciences, and I want to use humanities, 
And uh, this firefighting thing I'm doing, well, geez, that's super cool. I wish I could do something like that. And then it hit me and I even laughed at myself. It was like, oh, you should join the military. And I was like, oh, that's a stupid idea. And it stuck with me and that's what I ended up doing. So that's kind of my decision-making process. And I, I researched that because I was trying to defend that to Jesse because since most of what he sees is me sitting there talking about something completely different and then all of a sudden going off in a fit and saying, guess what I'm researching? I'm going to do this. And he's like, why are you, what? And it seems completely foreign and alien to him. So I wanted to research that and explain it for the sake of all other people who follow hunches and gut checks out there. Yeah, I think from the outside, the way that I interpret Jean's decision-making process is very much fly by the seat of her pants. And I don't necessarily feel like through science I need to back up why my <laughs> process is vetted and sound. But it is also appreciated hearing that I'm reading through these articles that Jean shared and will be posted on the website, but reading through them and seeing that there really is a science to it. And I understand that all people are different. I suppose I have difficulties in understanding necessarily how she comes to the decisions that she comes to because my decision-making process is so different. And for myself, to summarize it, there's a book that I've talked about quite a bit in several different episodes, Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point. And there's a couple different stories inside of it. There's the one of having the choice of either spending lunch with your soon-to-be boss every day for a month or getting 15 minutes in their bathroom. And which of the two would you prefer? And for a lot of people, myself included, I would prefer to have lunch with them. Have that long period of time of getting to know the person. But the research has been done that you actually come to the same decision-making process in both of them. And then there's also... I would totally go for the bathroom. Yeah, I, I, I know. And there's the other side of it where this whole concept of 10,000 hours, and there's so many articles about 10,000 hours and becoming a master of something, and I think that's a little bit different, but to try and put it in the same context of decision-making, I think it applies in the fact that you need time in order to become a master. You need time in order to become an expert. And with my decision-making processes, while I'm not necessarily going to be an expert on the topic, I want to be as close as I can within the time frame that I'm given to make as informed of a decision as I possibly can. So, great example would be when Jean and I, we took a trip to Florida and New York. And the decision-making process for myself was vetting any and every airline, looking at any and every hotel, looking at itineraries, looking at time schedules. There was a lot of research that was put into it. And of course, naturally, in going through that vetting of the information, there'd be Gene with, oh, why don't we go here? And, oh, what about that? And, you know, because it was a trip for both of us, I tried to incorporate as many of those things as possible. And yet, at the same time, it drove me crazy a little bit because it was, well, I have this plan. And now that I have this plan, I feel like it's fairly finalized. Now this throws a wrench in. Of course, being as sweet as she is, oh, well, we don't have to do that. It's just an idea. But that's how I interpret a lot of Jean's decisions, is they're just ideas. 
versus for myself with all the research and the time and the vetting process that I do, it doesn't feel like it's just an idea. It feels like it is a a distilled pressure cooker, slow mm. cooker based decision that it there's a lot more time involved. And by having more time, it allows me to feel much more comfortable with going forward with whatever decision it is that I make. And so, as we talked about the start, knowing that both of our decision-making processes are different, I guess for you, Jean, how do you, as somebody that goes with your gut, more often than I do. How do you cope with the fact of knowing that I'm somebody that struggles with that, that I need more time in order to make a decision? Well, whenever I'm working with you for things like that, I, I always try to recognize that it will take a longer. I mean, to me, it, it seems like, oh, well, you can pick this thing or that thing, so let's just spend 10 minutes and pick one. And I know it'll take a bit longer. So a lot of times, like, when he was wanting to plan the whole Florida trip, you know, I, I, I knew it was your thing, and I'd let you run with it. <laughs> I did have one one request, which was was Broadway. And uh, Jesse definitely found a way to, to get that in there. So that was all. That was all good. Um I mean, I think it works well for you. I think they tend to work well with the way we deal with the reactions of ourselves to our own decisions. I know that if you make a decision and it turns out to maybe not be the best one, you also spend a lot of time regretting it and wondering how you made it. And it, it impacts you a lot. And while I check a lot of my my big decisions, and I really kind of do some soul searching, a lot of times I also know that in terms of everyday decisions, I may not make the best decision at that time. My gut might have been wrong, but I usually find a way to positively spin it. It doesn't bother me. So I think what bothers me more is when I spend a lot of time not doing something when I could have been doing something. And so I think our decisions work really well. For us, I think the big problem is us trying to do something together. <laughs> when we're trying to make a decision together, or talking about life decisions that impact both of us. Yeah, I I do think when we're talking life decisions that impact both of us, they tend to they <laughs> <laughs> they have this very like like a I'll make the analogy of a teenage driver that. They just, they lay on the gas and they hit the brake. And they lay on the gas and they hit the brake. And I'm not going to say that necessarily annoys both of us and we're both frustrated. I do think there can be times in there. But there are parts and aspects of it that we tend to move quicker in some things and other things. There's a vetting process. And I think to get into how when knowing that you have different decision-making processes and knowing that you need to be adaptable, I think part of that is being able to just go with the flow. I know for myself, from a development standpoint, I've had to basically make a hierarchy. I've had to make a process with my process for <laughs> making decisions. And I've had to decide, okay, you know what? Dinner, not really something I need to do a ton of research. Do I like going on the Yelp and doing a Google search and finding five different options and vetting all of them with you? Yeah, that's fun. I actually enjoy that. That potentially drives you crazy at times, but I also think there's a slight appreciation in that. And then there's other times when, well, just for example, in Sacramento, we're just we're just going to walk down our street. For me, there's a slight bit of paranoia inside because I know I'm a pain in the ass when it comes to 
based on my dietary, I don't want to say restrictions, but choices that I make, and your dietary choices, that it can be challenging, very challenging, to find a place that we collectively can eat at. And so to just walk down our street as an example and go find something, there's a bit of worry inside. But at the same time, it's that letting go and being able and understand, you know what, you have to be adaptable. You have to be able to roll with the punches. And so for somebody that likes having a lot more time, that's very process-oriented, process-driven, research-based decision-making, I believe it's good for me and it's helped make me a better decision maker and it's allowed me to not my parents always thought that I was a worry word I was going to give myself ulcers and so as a result of us being very different it's allowed me to be more adaptable and then there's even times when we're not together when with other people that I have to make decisions whether it's at work or with friends and I'm just able to go with it and it's interesting because Oftentimes I'll get complimented or commended. Oh, that was that was so great. You were just able to just figure it out. And I have to laugh a little bit because I know deep down if I had my choice, what it is that I would want to do. So an effort to collaborate and an effort to fly by the seat of our pants because this is unlike the articles that you found, Gene. This is really an on-the-spot collaboration, which, mm. mind you, we have done now for the past three podcasts together. It's been very unscientific, mm. which is a little bit against how, from a format standpoint, I've tried to do these podcasts, especially with the newest format that I've gone with. But an effort to fly by the seat of our pants, just go with our gut, use our intuition... How would you say, if you know that you, whether it's using myself as an example, or your friends, or coworkers, but we have millions of decisions that we make on a daily basis, and you know, and we're not just talking about decisions that you personally have to make, they're decisions that affect or require collaboration, and you know that the individuals that you're with are different from how you think. They are not going with their gut. They're more systematic like I am or vice versa. So what's the first thing that you need to keep in mind in order to make that decision-making process be successful? Well, one of the things I try to do um, as someone who goes with hunches a lot is I, I backtrack. I back research. So you, you have this hunch, you're pretty certain you're right or that you're making a good decision, and then I try to translate. I analyze, well, why do I, I think this? Where did I get this information from? Where am I getting these things from? What did I see that triggered this? And I try to translate it for other people. So now it's not just a, well, this is the sense I got. It's now I have some some facts and some things going on that I can use to backtrack to translate things into into their language. I also like to wait for, for verification. I think one of the things that I, I learned from you um, is you see if things come up multiple times. Um, a recent example is I recently bought a, a expensive blender and I think it, you were more accepting of this because I have brought it up multiple times. There have been multiple moments where I went, oh man, because of this, I'm really going to need this blender. Ah, uh, because of this, I'm really going to need a blender. And finally, when it came up for a third and, and final time, I was like, you know what? <laughs> I think I actually need this. Um, so there was that repetition of, of things as well. I think the more you can let people in on your your thinking process and the more you can repeat things as a hunch person, the less it seems like an idea is out of the blue and you're flying by the seat of your pants. It shows that 
you've had it on your mind for a while. So I think the more you can let people in, the more you can translate, and the more you can show consistency, the more people will learn to trust your thought processes. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think those are two extremely viable, as somebody that likes having more time, knowing and understanding and, and hearing the reasoning for why you came up with that. Not only does it give me more time in order to try and either have a counter argument or to accept it, but it does allow somebody that's more process oriented to see that. I think for myself, for somebody that goes more with their gut, I know that things change also very rapidly. For somebody that goes with their gut, they just fly by, as I've used several times, fly by the seat of their pants. That's the perception. And yet, for me, where I found that I can be successful in collaborating because I am a research-driven individual, even in making on-the-spot decisions, is having alternatives. Having alternatives to the main decision. And it could be right in that moment to go back to the example of R Street. I know because I've been on R Street, or even if I, let's say I haven't even been on R Street. I don't even know what's here. And we're just going to walk, and on the right-hand side is a Thai restaurant. We go to it, and everything's made with goat milk. Well, that's great for you, but it's not going to be so great for me. But I know from an alternative standpoint, hey, you know what? Let's keep walking. Let's keep going up. And we actually did this the other day. We did this on Monday for our trip out in Ukiah. Is we, and we actually wound up walking the wrong direction, ironically, which was pretty amusing, although it did allow us to find the co-op, which led us to our dessert. Which was amazing. Which was amazing. But that was very much a fly by the sea of our pants sort of descent. But we had alternatives. The, the theory was, okay, there's this restaurant and there's this other one. We can walk towards it. And in that, we actually wound up founding something we otherwise wouldn't have known about, and we wouldn't have had a dessert. And now you have found your vegan ice cream of choice, despite the very costly <laughs> <laughs> price point for it. And then when we went to the co-op, the Sacramento co-op today, we found it. And you don't have to go to Ukiah three and a half hours away. You found it. But that never would have happened if we didn't say, you know what? And we actually, the first restaurant that we saw, we actually wound up coming back to it. Well, I think this is actually a very good illustration of us using both of our thought processes. So what actually happened was that we went to lunch and then we went to the hot springs and you got a sheet of all the good res restaurants recommended by this one place. So... We had these recommendations, we talked about all the different recommendations, and we picked a restaurant that we were going to go to. We found a, a parking spot and decided to walk towards the restaurant and maybe just stop and look at other ones on the way. So we started walking, and uh, of course we ended up realizing eventually that we had walked in the completely wrong direction. So instead of saying, we're going to walk all the way back and go to this restaurant, we decided to go to one of the ones that we had seen on the way, which was actually really good, but we, we had alternatives. We didn't pick the first thing that we saw, but we also were adaptable. We didn't spend overly long trying to find a parking space or driving around to pick anything. We had some basic information. We took off and we, we used that, but we also didn't get bogged down by that information. And we ended up making a decision in a, a timely manner and picked something that was good and discovered a bunch of new things on the way. So we worked together and used both of our decision-making processes to have a pretty enjoyable experience. Yeah, I would agree with that. So 
making sure that you're backtracking and providing that reasoning for your decision, having alternatives, and as the example of if this place doesn't work out, maybe we'll try this. Even if you don't really know where that alternative is going to lead you to, what else? What's another thing that you can use to collaborate to ensure that regardless of your decision-making processes being aligned or disaligned can you use? I think it it might go along with alternatives, but I would say be observant and be flexible. Because as a hunch person, if things come in that contradict your hunch, it's really difficult to fight that. And as someone who's logic-based, I know that sometimes it's it's frustrating to deal with people who can't exactly articulate why they want to do things. And so I think it's important, like we were when we were looking at the different restaurants and stuff, we were observant. We were observing everything that was around us. We went, oh, hey, a co-op, you know, which became useful later. Um, and we also were, were flexible and open to, to change. We never got so set in our ways that we couldn't take in new information to change our decisions. And so I think that's really important, especially when you're working with people, to always observe them and always be open-minded with the information that they're giving you and flexible. Yeah, I would agree. So in recap, we've talked about decision-making processes and how they can be different for different individuals. Jean is very much more of a hunch, go with her gut instinct. It has been proven and vetted scientifically <laughs> through psychologytoday.com and life science, which will be linked to on the website, versus I am much more of gathering as much information as possible, having as long of a decision-making process as I can and figuring out as much information as I can about that specific category or topic. Malcolm Gladwell, his book, The Tipping Point, talks about having the ability to have as much information as possible versus just going with your gut. And he claims and theorizes that you wind up actually coming to the same decision, which is probably why Gene and I are able to get along because <laughs> in the end, we wind up coming to the decision that we each did. Now, for me, it might be scary because she did very little research, just went with her gut, and for her, it might feel like an eternity for me to get to the same point that she was able to figure out 15 seconds into the actual decision-making process. But and it's important because... While we get to make a lot of solo decisions, we talked a lot about having your squad, having your circle, and unless you are specifically working for yourself and you deal with no people, you're a hermit, eventually you're going to encounter other people. And other people might have a different way of looking at things than you. And so it's about being able to be adaptable. And how can you collaborate? Gene mentioned that as somebody, whether you're a decision maker that goes with your gut or somebody that likes to vet all of the information, that providing information that backs up, that is able to show how you came to the decision that you came to, regardless of how long that process is, is the first step. The second step as I described, is having those alternatives, whether it's an in-the-moment gut instinct or you've done a lot of your research. Because with having those alternatives, it's going to allow you and the other people in the decision-making process to pivot very quickly. Because once you're in it, whether you're somebody that goes with your hunch or somebody that takes a lot of time, once you're in the process, you don't want to come back and take another month. In or no, you're in it and you're ready to go. 
you're ready to go. And so by having those alternatives, you're able to pivot very quickly and still be able to make the decision. And Gene, the third and final thing that we talked about was? Being flexible and observant. Being flexible, being observant. Not just physically, but mentally as well. I want to thank you all for tuning in today. Again, talk about the decision-making process. For more information on this, you can go to the website, policythinkconsider.com slash decision. And please go find something, liquid, solid, some sort of food. It could be a slurry. A slurry? What's a slurry? A mix between a liquid and a solid. I've never heard of that before. Go with your gut. You can be a slurry. Go try something new that you've never tried before. And I look forward to talking to you all tomorrow on Pause, Think, Consider. <laughs>